Welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Before I introduce today's guest, I'd like to let you know that this segment or this quarter, I think it's a quarterly magazine, Torx Over Knives, the new issue, the fall issue is out. It's a wonderful magazine with delicious recipes. What is that beep? They all have photos. And this time, there's a little story about me. So that's kind of cool. So today's guest was on the show before, but he was here as a chef doing an Iron Chef and he did a fabulous job. But he's actually a medical doctor, a plant-based doctor, who is the director of the Barnard Medical Center, which means if you're lucky enough to live in Washington, D.C., he can see or travel there. He could see you in person, but he also can do telemedicine in five different states. And today he's going to talk about how food as medicine is a thing that is really important and the transformational power of a whole food plant-based diet and lifestyle. Please welcome back to the show, Dr. Jim Lewis. It's so nice to see you. Nice to see you. Yeah, I love what you do, by the way. And I, you know, I just want to start out with, I think not everybody necessarily knows because not everybody reads the credits of a movie, but you were heavily involved in the film Game Changers, which itself was a game changer. It was. And I, I have to say that was such an exciting project um, to, to, to be involved with and, um, you know, meeting. So actually meeting some of my heroes, I'd always been a runner in college and I'd been a marathon runner way back when. And people like Scott Jurek, for example, uh, even before I went plant based, it was, was kind of a hero to me and being able to, to meet him and all the other really amazing athletes uh, involved in the film. It was really like a dream come through, I have to tell you. Find you for that project? Well, it, this is an interesting story. So, um, you know, I went plant based in 2011 for some my own personal health reasons. Uh, we, we can talk about that in, in a little bit about how I got to, to how, I, how I discovered plant based uh, diets and, and what happened to me. But anyway, I, I got on plant based, I'd lost some weight, and, and I was out to dinner one night and I ran in to a colleague named John Benegas and his wife, Susan Benegas, who you may know, is the executive director of American College of Lifestyle Medicine and works with Scott Toll, Stoll in, uh, in the Plantrition Project. And I hadn't, I didn't know Susan. I was in St. Louis and I didn't know Susan, uh, but I knew her husband who was a, uh, a, who was a, a colleague, or a medical colleague. And he said, wow, you lost a lot of weight. You know, are you okay? And I you know, I thought maybe I had cancer or something. I'd lost so much weight. And I said, no, I, you know, I went on a plant-based diet. And Susan's eyes got about this big and said, oh my God, I'm in that space. In fact, I'm, I'm planning the very first ever uh, medical conference around plant-based nutrition down in, in, in uh, Naples, Florida in a few months. Would you mind if we, would you mind putting out, if I put out a press release and kind of told your story? And, and when I lived in St. Louis, uh, um, I had been the team doctor for the St. Louis Cardinal baseball team and the St. Louis Rams football team. So I'd worked with professional athletes and that was in the little, in the little um, bio. And it mentioned Forks Over Knives, which is what I had seen, the movie, I, the documentary that really turned me on to this whole uh, way of, 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 of eating and, and living and, and such. So the press release goes up and it mentions forks over knives. And about two days later, I'm in the office and Brian Wendell, who's the producer and now a good friend, call, calls the office and says, can I speak to Dr. Loomis? He says, that was an amazing story. We need more, um, we need more people like you. Would you mind writing a blog post for, for forks over knives? This is like 2013. And I also want to introduce you uh, to, to uh, a, a guy named James Wilkes, who is putting together this film on athletes and plant-based diets. And this was very, very early in the Game Changers project. Um, um, and, and so that's how I met James through, through actually John Corey, who had helped help Brian with the Forks Over Knives product project and was helping um, James early on in, in the Game Changers project. And when they first started, you know, they were very low budget. James had gotten a camera off of, I think, Craigslist or, or, or whatever, and, and came out to my office. He had a little boom mic, and I sat in my office in St. Louis, and, and it was very kind of low budget. And then, you know, things kind of took off from there, let's just say. The growing interest, they brought on James Cameron, executive producer. They brought on Luis Sahoya, who's, a, you know, a, a Academy Award and director. And so we reshot the whole thing, actually. And I, and I actually had moved to D.C. at the time and flew back to, to, to St. Louis. And, and they filmed my segment, actually. My, I called my friends at, at, at the Cardinals 
said, hey, would you mind borrow if we could borrow Bush Stadium for the day? And they said, well, sure, come on out. So, so we filmed my uh, my piece, uh, my interview, and in, in, in actually in Bush Stadium. But, but it all came about through a chance meeting with, with a, a colleague and, and his wife, who, again, now great friends. I, I do a lot of work with Susan. And, and uh, anyway, it, it's pretty, pretty amazing. That is really interesting. And it just seems that I've interviewed quite a few doctors, and it seems that it's either seeing forks over knives or reading the China study was their point of entry to adopting a plant based diet. Yeah. So, so, you know, what happened to me was, you know, I, I thought healthy eating, you know, first of all, as you well know, uh, as a physician, I, I learned I, I had absolute little to no meaningful education around the nutrition in medical school, right? It was really, you know, a couple of classes and it was really glorified biochemistry. You know, this is a carbohydrate, this is a protein, these are vitamins. And then here are the diseases you get if you don't get enough of these things. Uh, we didn't really learn anything about meaningful about food. And, um, you know, I, so I thought eating healthy was, was kind of low fat dairy and lean meat, and not too much ice cream and, you know, try to get some fruits and vegetables and plenty of whole grains. And unfortunately, uh, discovered that you literally can't outrun a mediocre diet because um, in 2010, I tore my meniscus playing with my dog and I had to wait a few months to get surgery because I was really busy and my leg got weak and then I didn't do the rehab after. And I, all of a sudden, I very suddenly gained a lot of weight uh, fairly quickly. And next thing I know, um, I, I developed an irregular heart rhythm. I developed extra atrial fibrillation. And it turns out I had undiagnosed sleep apnea. Um, and so, and then I go see my internist and, and my cholesterol's through the roof and I've got borderline diabetes. Well, no one ever had a conversation with me about my lifestyle. They just, they were giving, and these are world-class docs from, from WashU and St. Louis. You know, I'm wearing a CPAP machine. I'm on antiarrhythmic pills for my heart. I, I need to be on cholesterol medicine. And I'm like, you know, just kind of muddling through trying to sort out what's going on. And frankly, I kind of knew where this was headed because this is, this is the story of like most of the majority of my patients, you know, I was taking care of these chronic in retrospect, you know, foodborne illnesses. And, um, um, and so one day I'm laying on the couch, I had a prescription for statins for Lipitor in my, in my wallet. I'm laying on the couch, flipping through Netflix. And I come across this documentary forks over knives. I've never heard of it. And, you know, I start watching. I mean, I kind of, I knew what a vegan was, but to me, you know, my perception of a vegan was someone who wore Birkenstocks and ate granola and hugged trees and just, just wasn't my gig. Right. You know, I mean, again, we all have, I think pretty prof most people have a lot of cognitive dissonance around food and what food really, where food really comes from, you know, in retrospect, obviously, but, but the idea of using food as medicine particularly plant-based food, it was, so, it was such a compelling argument after I watched the documentary. And I came back to, the, I was on the faculty at WashU, and I came back and looked up some of the primary research and then ordered China study. And I ordered, um, you know, there was only about two books out there that were available that were science-based. And, and almost overnight went plant-based and made a commitment to rehab my knee, which I hadn't done. This was, this was 10 years ago, July, actually. So July of 2011. Well, four months without really doing any exercise of the knee strength, I lost like 40 pounds. My sleep apnea went away. The AFib went away. My cholesterol dropped 100 points. My prediabetes went away. Um, my, my, I could exercise again after a few months. Ended up doing a couple of half marathons the next year, and then a marathon and a half Ironman the next year. And, you know, fast forward at age 60, two years ago, when I turned 60, I wanted to do something. I actually did a, a, a Lake Placid Ironman and did a full Ironman uh, race. Um, and so it, it was through that process that I realized that that much of what I learned in med school maybe wasn't the right way to think about taking care of people and that what I was practicing for most of my career was not health care, it was sick care. And um, you know, once you kind of have that knowledge, you can't unhave it. And, and it really, so not only did learning about and adopting a plant-based diet transformed my own personal health. It, it transformed the way I practice medicine, really, professionally. That is amazing. What did you actually do on the Game Changers? Like, were you the medical advisor for the film? No, no, no. So they had a, um, um, they had a, a number of, of so the, the movie is about, um, it's kind of the story of James Wilkes. So James was a mixed martial arts fighter. He, he won Ultimate Fighter. Um, um, 
and he had got he got injured and and when he was recovering from his knee injury he he kind of started thinking about is there evidence that what we eat can accelerate healing and 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 that started him on this journey and discovered the role that that many high level athletes were were plant based and so the movie is really his story interspersed with uh, expert interviews so i was one of the medical experts um and uh, along with athletes and then there's some the, 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 it's really it's really interesting because there's been some pushback about the movie um but like i think what, people what, who, for exa- what was the pushback for example I, well I but, you know that you that it's that the cherry pick science and all that and it, it's just not true the the the, the movie only really said three things. It said that you you can be strong, you can be fast, you can run a long ways and, 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 and not eat meat. And if you don't eat meat, the, you'll be healthier and the planet will be healthier. I mean, that's all it said. It didn't say, you know, you have to be plant-based to perform or you can't perform if you eat meat. And so some people misconstrued, I think, the message you know, that you have to eat plants to perform, which is not what the movie said at all. It just said that you don't have to eat meat to perform. And if you don't eat meat, you'll be healthier and the client, it'll be, the planet will be healthier. I mean, it was, it's, and you can't really, you can't argue with it because we can, we can all have our own opinions, but we can't have our own facts. And in fact, I was very, very impressed um, when my portion of the, and and actually there's a, there's a, and I have a couple few minutes in the film, which was a lot there's probably an hour or two's worth of B-roll um, that, that didn't make the, the cut, if you will. But every statement I made in the movie, I sent James a scientific reference. And so it's the first time I've ever seen you watch the film. And, and when I'm talking and they put a graphic up, the actual scientific reference is at the bottom of the, of the screen. Um, and, and they have a whole compendium of the research um, on their website, you can go and, and read. And there was a couple things that, you know, in the edits where James called me and said, hey, you know, you said this, um, I can't really find some science to support it. And we took it out because, because the science wasn't as strong as it needed to be. So um, they, they were, the, the whole Game Changers team was very diligent in making this an evidence-based um, uh, film, which is, is really, uh, again, I, I applaud them for that because um, 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 you can't, you can't argue with the science. I mean, the facts are the facts, opinions are opinions, facts are facts. And, and so th- they did a really good job weeding out kind of some of the more bro science stuff, as they say, and, and, and making sure it was evidence-based. Yeah. Well, I think the people that criticize it are people that just want to keep eating meat, destroying no, the planet right. and uh, harming animals because, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. how could you even do, I mean, you couldn't take a group of athletes. I mean, could you take a group of athletes and put one of them on a plant-based diet and one of them on a meat diet and then, you know, compare them? I mean, could that even be done? Yeah, that would be a difficult study because, you know, we all have our own, you know, there's, it's, it's hard to control for training and genetics and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but um, there's a lot of the athletes who talk about what happened after they went plant-based and this happened to me. I mean, I'm not an Olympian, but you know, I ran meds, I ran marathons in med school and I was a pretty competitive runner. I'd run a marathon. I, I couldn't walk for two or three days. I was so stiff and sore and the training and all that. It's 60 years old. I do an Ironman. I'm, I never got stiff, stiff. I never got sore. I'm, I was training way harder than I ever did in medical school and, and, and it's, because I'm convinced it's because of the diet. And, and that's what every athlete will say. It's not so much performance per se, it's the ability to recover and the way you perform, the harder you can train, obviously, the better you're going to perform and being able to perform at a high level and recover quicker and not be banged up. I mean, Derek Morgan talks about this in the, in the, in the, in the movie, he's a um, defensive uh, lineman or defensive end for the um, Tennessee Titans. Um, that, that, you know, he, I think he makes it, and I can tell you, this is true from being a team doctor for an NFL team, the injury rate in the NFL is hundred percent. And, and, you know, everybody, everybody after the game is bruised and, and battered um, after, after a hard game. And he talked about how the, the soreness and stiffness he suffered before uh, just kind of went away. And even the inflammatory markers in his blood improved uh, after he went on a plant-based diet. So, so the anti-inflammatory nature of the diet itself is, is I think what drives a lot of the performance advantage. And, and it's interesting, 
that Chris Paul, who was one of the uh, producers as well as a you know, perennial all-star NBA player. Yeah, and I, I met him at, the, uh, yeah, I met him at, um, at the Game Changers premiere in LA. And he said, he, he made a really profound statement. He said that when he first went plant-based, he didn't want to tell anybody about it. He didn't want to tell his teammates or whatever, not because they would have made fun of him, like, which is what would have happened a few years ago, I think. It was because it, he, he, got, he felt like it gave him such a competitive advantage. He didn't want to give away the secret, right? I love it. I love it. That's a great way. <laughs> Listen, we yeah. have a fan on. Mary says, this is my primary care doctor. He's fabulous, all caps, and takes such good care of his patients. I'm a living testimony, stroke at 50, now at days away from 65 I should wear glasses, shouldn't I? Dealing with a 75% blockage in a carotid artery. Four years out from first appointment with Dr. Loomis, no operation for me. Whole food, plant-based, no oil lifestyle is seeing me through va through vascular surgeon, still follows me. He's amazed. Thank you, Dr. Loomis. Oh, uh, yeah. I bet well, you're a great doctor. And, you can do it. And, and, and so we, we have somebody named Jay watching live saying, are you taking patients either at the center in person or through telemedicine? And maybe I you am. can mention the five states that you can see people. Yes. In. Yeah. So I'm currently licensed in uh, DC, uh, Virginia, Maryland, uh, Missouri, and Florida. Um, I have a California license, which should be um, up and running here soon. Where Ooh, but I can see you. That would be so fun. Yeah. I, love, yeah. I, love, I love telemedicine. I got to tell you. you oh, know, it's it, great. It, you know, and because of what we do is it really, because we focus so much on lifestyle um, uh, ch change, uh, it really lends itself to telehealth because I can order blood work, you know, through LabCorp or whatever, wherever you're at. And the results come directly into our computer and we can communicate. I mean, most people, if we're, if, if it's more of a lifestyle consultation, if you will, most people still need to have a local primary care doctor if they're not able to come out to DC, which is fine. We see a lot of patients uh, to help them, you know, prevent, treat, and even reverse some of their chronic diseases because unfortunately, um, most doctors really have no clue about even what type 2 diabetes is, frankly. And, and so um, we've got dietitians now um, and we're, we're working hard, I think, pretty much all the states we have clinicians licensed in, um, there are, um, we have dietitians licensed there as well. And those are all telehealth visits. And by the way, uh, we, we do have uh, three other fabulous clinicians on staff at the Barnard Medical Center. Christine Slakovitz, who's our um, nurse practitioner, Benita Rahman, who's a, a primary care doctor, and Jasmine Sardana, who's a primary care doctor. They're, they're also licensed in a number of states that I'm not, you know, Pennsylvania, Georgia, New York, uh, um, so if you go on to barnardmedicalcenter.org, you can find a list of states that, uh, that we offer services and we're, we're, we, I mean, every, we can talk more about the Barnard Medical Center here in a minute, but I have to say, it's pretty amazing to work in a place where every single employee from the person that answers the phone to the person who puts you in the room and checks your blood pressure to the person who sends in, you know, bills your insurance are all whole food plant-based. I love and, it. And I we, know. You know, I mean. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. It, it, it's, it's really amazing to be in such an environment where we all seem, it's, it's shame, share the same kind of philosophy and, and vision about what health really should be. You don't have to like smell stinky bacon microwaving in the lunchroom. I'm no, and you right. don't have to have the dietitian telling you to milk, drink milk to get your calcium, right? Which is what happens sometimes when you refer people out into the community for you know, nutrition counseling. Well, we have the link in the show notes for people to get an appointment at the Barnard Medical Center. You had mentioned four doctors, uh, Dr. Raman and Dr. Uh, Dr. Sardal have already been on the show, but the fourth name I'm not familiar with. She's a nurse practitioner, Christine. Well, um, you'll have um, to introduce me because I would love I to will. have her on the show. Yeah, yeah. Is, that's yeah, fabulous. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. you know, um, there's someone said once that, you know, obviously most athletes probably aren't plant-based and they still win Olympic medals, but I've heard them say that they, they win despite their diet, not because of it. Has yeah. any athlete ever done anything extraordinary, like on a keto or a carnivore diet? Is there any Not that I know of. Uh, yeah. What? Well, not, not that I know of. And, and if you're an endurance athlete, in particular, you, you couldn't survive on a carnivore diet. That's, that's, I mean, don't even get me started with that because it just doesn't that drive you crazy. I it mean, it does because the, the, there's absolutely no, you know, the fact, you know, people are, there's, and these, there's some doctors who advocate for this, you know, that we don't need fiber in our diet. You know, I mean, here's the way I think about, about this chef. Um, 
And, you know, what does it mean to be healthy and to perform, right? So what does that mean as human beings? What, what did we evolve to do, right? Well, like any living creature, at fundamental level, all of our behavior, all of our physiology, all of our metabolism, nutritional needs, we evolved to try to facilitate living long enough to find a mate and pass on our DNA, right? And, and for most of human history, there was two tasks we had to be able to accomplish for that to occur. We had to be able to find food when we're starving and not be someone else's food when they're starving. And, and that's where our stress came from. And we had to respond to that stress through physical activity. So we all evolved to be athletes, if you will, because we had to be able to hunt and gather food or run away from fight leopards to survive. So again, you look at the biomechanics of our feet and ankles, you look at our cardiorespiratory physiology, you look at our stress response. You know, we have adrenaline, which is primarily designed to get us ready to perform activity. And then we have cortisol to help us recover. And assuming we survive, that's when we rest, recover, and refuel. And we refuel with whatever we can find around us on a given day. And we'll talk about that in a second. And it was that cycle of stress, activity, recovery, repetitively over time. That's how we built resilience to things, right? We got stronger and faster and smarter. That's how you train for a marathon or Olympic weightlifting or whatever. And all is good. Now we fast forward to the modern world. The vast majority of people, we don't do any of that, right? I mean, how many calories do most people burn to get more calories every day? Well, not very many, right? We have Instacart and Uber Eats and grocery stores and restaurants. The kinds of energy and nutrients that, that most people consume bear little to no resemblance to what we're supposed to be eating. And we'll talk about that in a sec. We don't face stress and threat physically anymore. You know, we, 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 we run and fight emotionally. And we worry about a lot more stuff. Most of us, the starving, death, and eaten by leopards, we're worried about jobs and money and COVID and relationships and health and politics and traffic and weather and on and on and on. And then we compound it by not adequately rest and recovering. You know, we drink too much caffeine. We drink too much alcohol. We don't get enough sleep. The sleep's not restful. So over time, as opposed to resilience, you know, we get exhausted. We have physical exhaustion, hormonal exhaustion, mental exhaustion. And in fact, I would argue it's in this evolutionary mismatch lifestyle, which is 90% of the cause of 90% of the chronic problems that I see every day in the office, right? Obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, breast cancer, colon cancer, insomnia, autoimmune disease, all of it, right? And, and so, so to be well, to, to, to practice true health care, to help my patients become well and perform, whether you're an athlete or not, or not uh, we have to become, we have to just replicate that lifestyle. So what does that mean? Well, we have to achieve physical wellness and we do that through movement, right? We need 30 minutes to an hour most days, a couple of days a week, we need to replicate picking stuff up and moving it out of the way. We need to be emotionally well. That's about stress, stress management and sleep. And then we need to be nutritionally well, which means two things. We got to eat we're supposed to eat and stop eating what we're not supposed to eat. I think the other thing we under-recognize is how connected these domains are. The fact you can't truly be emotionally well without regular physical activity. And in fact, the more stress you have, the more exercise you need, because your brain can't tell adrenaline you're worrying about COVID and seeing leopards, right? So what happens when we overstress and underexercise? Well, all that adrenaline turns against us. We get anxious, we can't sleep, our mind's racing around, so we don't recover from the stress, which just makes it worse. The cortisol we're making, which is designed to help us heal, that's why we give cortisone shots, but it also stimulates our appetite and preferentially stores we get as belly fat because it's trying to help you refill the gas tank before the next leopard. So again, when we overstress and underexercise, that cortisol turns against us. We stress eat, we gain weight, it's hard to lose weight, right? Fundamental text between diet and exercise. I mean, you don't park your car in the garage for you and not drive it, but still put gas in it five times a day, right? You don't put diesel gas in your car in moderation if you want it to run right. I mean, you know, we take better care of our cars than we do of ourselves. And now I think most of us get we need to move around and not stress out and get a good night's sleep. You know, the million dollar question is the diet question. What is the optimum diet for human health and performance? Well, I, again, I would argue we make diet way too complicated. In fact, I would argue that, that we're designed to eat the same types of foods our ancestors have been eating for tens of thousands of years. And this perception, as they talk about in the Game Changers, this idea our ancestors were hunter-gatherers is wrong. We were gatherer hunters, right? It was much easier to gather calories off the ground than out of the woods than it was to hunt down big animals. But what did we gather? It was primarily unprocessed plants. It was roots and stems and leaves and seeds and fruits and nuts and vegetables and berries and legumes. It was whole food plant-based, right? There was no white flower tree or canola oil bush or Dr. Pepper nut. Um, we didn't have access to dairy products. I mean, we there, and there's several lines of evidence of that. We, we had to domesticate other mammals to get access to their milk. And that didn't occur until about 7,000, 8,000 years ago, which may seem like a long time, but literally a blink of an eye if you look at all of human history. And second of all, as you 
well know, you know, what is dairy? Well, it's a biologic fluid that evolved to facilitate baby mammals turning into mammals big enough to find food on their own. And it was species specific. And once that happens, we don't need our mother's milk anymore. And that's why you don't see human milk on the grocery store shelf. We'd all find that pretty bizarre. So, so the idea we should be drinking another mammal's milk that evolved to facilitate a 70 pound cow turn a 700 pound cow just doesn't make sense. Um, now, there's no doubt that our ancestors did eat some meat, but I think there's three very important points. A, it wasn't very much. We don't know for sure because we haven't found any paleolithic food diaries, but best estimates, probably 20, 20, 20, 25% of our calories came from animal-based products. The rest were plant-based. B, they were wild animals, not cows and pigs and chickens, which are industrially raised, you know, in confined feeding lots and which changes the nutritional value, if you will, of the food. But most importantly, I think you could argue that our ancestors had a survival advantage to having that concentrated animal fat and protein because they needed to get big and strong and away from leopard before they died of some infectious disease when they were 30. So they never had to worry about if I eat all this meat, am I going to get cancer or have a heart attack because they were already dead. And we've unmasked that through the extension of human life expectancy, mainly through sanitation and antibiotics. And then you take one step further back and think about the implications of climate change and how we raise animals and climate and how we treat animals. I think you can make a very strong argument if you're not starved for calories, that a whole food plant-based diet is the optimum diet for human health and performance and, and the planet and the animals, et cetera. So again, nothing rocket science about this. But, but none of which, none of which I learned in medical school. And I had to kind of really do a deep dive into the science um, and, and teach myself this stuff. Um, 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 and, 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 you know, again, there's everything I just said is evidence-based, which is when we do practice evidence-based medicine at the Barnard Medical Center. I mean, I do write prescriptions for medications, statin medications, but everybody gets to understand there may be a different path you can take involving lifestyle, particularly plant-based diets to help help them prevent, treat and reverse their chronic diseases. So yeah. Kind of a long answer to simple question, but I just wanted to be clear that how I process this stuff and think about it. Right, well, that was very well said. And just like with the athletes that do well despite their diet, our ancestors, it wasn't because of the meat. They, had, they, they didn't have enough calories. They had to eat whatever was yeah, exactly. there. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And the other thing I think we overlook is we're all athletes, right? We don't think of ourselves as athletes, but you carry the groceries in from the car, you're being an athlete. You carry the, you, you carry the laundry up from the basement, you're being an athlete. You give your kid a, kid a piggyback ride, you're being an athlete. You kick a soccer bar around with, you know, in the neighborhood, you're being an athlete. We don't think of that as, I mean, some of us are more athletic than others, but, but it, it, as human beings, you know, we all evolve to be athletic. And, and again, you know, now an Olympic athlete obviously is at a different level, but, but the basic principles of what constitutes a healthy diet for performance is, is really the same. There's some nuances. If you're running a hundred, if you're Scott Jurek and you're running the Appalachian trail or you're, you know, Olympic weightlifter, there are some, there's some nuanced kind of differences in, in some of their requirements, but at a fundamental level, it's, it's all the same. Here's a nice comment from Susanna. Dr. Loomis looks so healthy and young for 62, just like Chef AJ, I'm a year <laughs> behind you, encouraging for this 54-year-old who is clawing her way back to health. And is Barnard Medical Center, is somebody certified in all 52 states? No, I think we've got about 25 now. Yeah, that's why I, the I person can't check. find, can somebody's looking in Kansas, that's why. Yeah, I don't think we're in Kansas right now. Okay. Um, um, we're slowly but surely expanding our presence. We kind of went for some states with, with, you know, with more people and, and, and I, I, I kept my Missouri license. I, I practiced in St. Louis for 25 years before I moved to, to DC to become the medical director at the Barnard Medical Center. So I still, I kept my Missouri license. I'm probably going to get an Illinois license back pretty soon, just because I have a lot of contacts in the St. Louis area, which sits right on the border. So, um, right. Um, that that's um, to come. Cool. Uh, Kelly says, Dr. Loomis has given me hope. I've been vegan for nearly four years and I'm working on losing weight in hopes of eliminating my AFib as well with the help of the True North Medical Center. You, you get good jobs though. I mean, working on game changers, medical director. Bar I mean, these are like choice vegan doctor jobs, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, so the story behind, so, so I went plant-based in, like I said, in 2010 2011. 
and as I started to, it is very, St. Louis is a great place to get sick, right? They've got world-class tertiary care there. You've got Wash U, you've got St. Louis University Medical School. It's a great place to get sick. But <laughs> um, I, it was not a great place to teach people how to lead a healthy lifestyle. Um, we had, there was no plant-based dietitians uh, really to speak of. Um, the, um, I, had di I had colleagues you know, I, I remember I was in the doctor's lounge one day and one of, I was having lunch and I had brought in my own food because the food they had in the doctor's lounge was like cold cuts and, you know, chicken and whatever. And, and I had some, I think I had a lentil stew or something I'd made. And one of my colleagues says, he said, I hadn't seen him. I says, wow, you look great. You lost a lot of weight. I said, yeah, you know, I saw this documentary forks over knives and I went plant-based and I lost all this weight and I had all these chronic metabolic conditions and they all went away. And he says, and this is a guy I referred patients to with for metabolic related diseases. He said, Oh, that, I heard about that documentary. Those guys are just a bunch of shills for PETA and they don't know what they're talking about. And I have, I have metabolic syndrome too. And I find if I just watch my diet, you know, if I exercise, it gets better. I look over, you know, for lunch, he's having a ham and cheese sandwich and, and, a, and a soda and some chips. And he's telling me that I'm crazy for, you know, going on a plant-based diet. I actually had endocrinologists accuse me of malpractice. Um, you know, patients would come in and, and they'd see me and three or four months later, they'd be off their insulin and they'd go see their diabetes doctor and, the, you know, how much, in, you look great, you lost weight, how much, how much insulin are you taking? Well, I, I stopped it. Who told you to do that? My internist. Well, um, you need to get a new internist because that's my practice. If he's telling you you can reverse type two diabetes, you know, it's not possible. They get their blood work back and guess what? Lo and behold, they don't have type two diabetes anymore. So the irony is, it's not that they didn't need, it's not that they needed to get a new primary care doctor. It's they didn't need their endocrinologist anymore. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of muddling through trying to do the best I can with, without much support. And, um, and I heard, um, I heard, that, that Neil was, I had met uh, Dr. Barnard. It, it, we, I was doing some speaking at the time. I was just starting to do a lot of speaking at conferences. And I had spoken at a conference with Neil and, and met him. And I saw that they were on Facebook, they were recruiting for a medical director for this new plant-based clinic they were opening. And I, um, I sent it, a, email to my friend or a text to my friend, Karen Dugan, who I think you've had on the show, who she was, we cooked together and, and, um, um, and said, what do you think? She goes, well, your resume should have been there yesterday. And I'm like, and I, I, I was, I, I was just kind of sending as like, yeah, wouldn't this be a dream job? And I thought, I said, well, maybe she's right. So I, I didn't really even have a CV or a resume because I never needed one. So I spent like two hours cleaning it up and send it off one day. And then, you know, like 10 days later, I had a new job. <laughs> two day, two weeks later, it was pretty crazy. My kids are all, we're all following college and stuff. So I thought well, maybe it's time to move. So I sold everything I own pretty much and moved to Washington, D.C. In, in December of 2015. And we opened in January of 2016. So it's been quite the journey. Are you thriving? I mean, I know you're for personally thriving, but is the Barnard Medical Center thriving? And no, yeah, no we're doing it. great. You know, it's interesting. And we, we obviously had a little, we had a, when COVID first hit, it was quite difficult, but we really used that is an opportunity and, and really started to expand our telehealth presence. And so really in many ways, it's been a blessing in disguise because um, um, patients love tell we're as busy as ever um, really um, in our, mainly because of our telehealth visit. We do see patients live in the office, uh, but we restrict it to, we're, we're only seeing annual physicals and um, um, a few other limited conditions that require people to come into the office. Uh, most of our work is still being done uh, via telehealth, which works out great. Yep. You know, it's interesting because it's been 10 years now, a little bit over 10 years since you saw Forks Over Knives and you transitioned immediately overnight. And I hear that a lot from a lot yep. of the plant-based doctors, either Forks Over Knives or China study, yet other doctors that also went to medical school, see the movie or even regular people and it has no impact on them. And I, I just, I just don't yeah. understand why people are so opposed yeah. To even or even going partway changing, but it's like, nah, 
you know, because we a lot of people struggle because they get this information and they want to have their families join them and they'll they'll see a movie like Game Changers or Forks Over Knives and it's I don't understand how this can have no impact on on people. But I, I think the reason is and so so this is a challenge I face every single day because it's interesting. We have three kinds of patients who come to the Barnard Medical Center. Probably the majority, probably sixty percent come because they, they, they've they seen Forks Over Knives, they've read How Not to Die, they, they've, they've seen something or read something and, and understand that, the, that and they've got chronic health conditions and they want to get better and they can't find the resources they need with their current, in the current medical care they're getting. So they come to us to help guide them through the process. So they, they, you, don't, you don't have to sell it to them. They've, they've already kind of bought into the idea. It's just, it's just helping them uh, progress through we have a small number of patients who are already plant-based, you know, kind of like me, who, who have no medical issues, their cholesterol's perfect, they're taking beat, they're, everything's good. And we, we just kind of pat ourselves on the back about how smart we are. And then, you know, I really don't need to see them again because they're healthy, right? And then we have a, you know, a fair number of patients who have no idea what we do. And, and, and you've got to really sell this idea. And in fact, the, the little spiel I gave earlier about what it means to be healthy is, is the spiel I give to every single patient to help them understand, you know, what health really is. But what I've come to conclude, the reason this is so hard, both even for patients who are already bought in and want to make a change, but still find it difficult, or patients who are presented with this information and, and, and have a hard time embracing it or in, in engaging, I think it's because it's something we don't talk about. I think it's because we ignore a simple fact that eating is a learned behavior. And all of our eating preferences, things we like, things we don't like, triggers to start eating, triggers to stop eating, you know, how we cook the food, how we celebrate with food, how we comfort ourselves with food. There are things we learned a long time ago. And once we learn them, we stop thinking about them. And again, it's, it's, by, it's by evolutionary design. I mean, think about walking. If you had to think about walking, I have to contract my quad, flex my hip, bend my knee. Uh, you would have walked right past the ripe berries and you wouldn't have seen the leopard and you wouldn't have lasted very long, right? So our brains, autom you know, very quickly after we habituate a task, whether it be walking or eating or even in the modern world driving, very quickly our subconscious brain takes over. And that's to allow our conscious brain to keep looking for opportunity and threats for berries and leopards, right? And we still have these kind of stone age brains in the, in the modern world. And so um, and, a, and a good example of that is something like white bread. I mean, white bread's not healthy, highly processed. But if the environmental trigger you learn to eat white bread is when the waiter puts it on the table at the restaurant, I mean, you don't have to think about eating the bread in that moment. You have to think about not eating the bread. And if you're tired of thinking because you had a busy day at work, you're out friends and family, what happens to the bread? You eat it, right? And it's like free food because it didn't even register in your consciousness. And happens all the time. Patients say, you know, doc, I'm trying this plant-based thing. And my blood sugars aren't getting better. And I ask them about what they had for dinner last night. And they say, well, you know, I went out to a restaurant and I had a beautiful quinoa kale salad, but what's not on the list? You know, the five pieces of bread slathered in olive oil, they ate waiting for the food to get there, right? Because it's outside of our consciousness. Now we can change that, but it's very, very difficult. And, and again, driving is another example of this, right? Um, you get in your car, you can listen to the radio, talk on the phone, you don't think about putting on your blinker and brakes every single time. Our subconscious brain is doing that for us. What would happen tomorrow if you moved to London? I mean, you're going to have to learn how to drive on the other side of the street, right? And it might take three to six months. Every time you get in that car, you've got to think about what side of the road am I on? Which side of the pedestrian is coming through the crosswalk? How do I go through the roundabout? And again, it might be three months. It might be six months. One day you get in the car and guess what? That's how you drive. So really what I talk to patients about, it's really about trying to teach yourself to drive on a different side of the street nutritionally, right? And, and, and once that happens, you know, people say, do you miss driving on the other side of the road? You might, I, I, you know, like um, I, th that's a silly question because I don't drive that way anymore. People ask me that all the time. Don't you miss barbecued pork ribs or don't you miss ice cream? The answer is no, because I don't eat barbecued pork ribs. So there's nothing to miss, right? Because I don't do it. Um, and by the way, you wouldn't think about driving on the wrong side of the road in moderation, would you? you would only have a moderate number of head-on collisions and run over a moderate number of pedestrians, right? Where every time you eat that piece of bacon or that bowl of ice cream, I mean, you're literally running over the endothelial lining of your blood vessels, you're running over your pancreas, you're running over your, your breast cells, your colon cells, on and on and on. Um, now, it's still not as easy as that sounds because driving on the wrong side of the road in a car 
the consequences are immediate and catastrophic, right? The head-on collision. Driving on the wrong side of the road, nutritionally, it might take decades for you to have that head-on collision. You know, if you wake up with chest pain and you're numb on one side, you have a lump in your breast or blood in your stool and you got colon cancer. So how do you stay focused long enough to get to get to that place where you're, you've taught yourself to drive on a different side of the road when driving on the wrong side of the road doesn't have these immediate and catastrophic concepts? There's catastrophic, but they're not immediate. So I haven't been through this myself and literally coached hundreds and hundreds of people through it. I, I, I like to use the analogy of pushing a snowball over the top of a mountain. Right. And some people's roads are really steep and the mountain's really tall. Right. But once you get the snowball over the top, you don't have to push anymore. You start to feel better. You get off medicines. You like the way you look in clothes. You have more energy. Everything just gets better and better and better. The hard part's getting the snowball to the top. And and I think there's three fundamental things that have to happen for that to occur. And the first is you have to find a reason to push. And I think we as clinicians try to scare people. We use a paradigm of fear right? Quit smoking and get cancer or get your blood pressure down. You're going to have a stroke or get your cholesterol down. You're going to have a heart attack, whatever. People already know that stuff, right? And it might motivate them for a week when they leave the doctor's office, but it doesn't promote long-term change. So a different way to frame purpose is to ask a different question. And that is, why would it be important for you not to have those bad things happen? And I've actually done this as an exercise, right? I mean, if I gave you five pieces of paper and had one was breast cancer and one was colon cancer and one was heart attack and one was stroke and one was Alzheimer's, and ask you to write down the top five reasons you don't want those things to happen to you, you'd come back with one piece of paper. It's all the same, right? You know, for my kids or my grandkids or my retirement, whatever it is. Um, so that's number one. Number two is you got to figure out how to lower the slope of the road and the height of the mountain. And that's honestly and, and systematically asking yourself the question, what's going to make this hard for me? Uh, you know, I don't know how to cook. I don't know how to shop. I don't know what quinoa is. I eat when I'm stressed out. You know, I travel. I'm on a budget. I don't have a lot of time. There's answers to all those things. Unfortunately, even in the last 10 years, there are a tremendous number of resources that are available now. I mean, you know, you've got places like Karen's Center for Plant-Based Living, where, where she's got online cooking classes you can go to. There's YouTube channels. There's books. There's re you know, restaurants. I mean, it's much easier to do now than it was. And then lastly, and probably, and we have a, a, a lot of programs at PCRM. Uh, we have the 21 day kickstart program. We've got um, um, upcoming um, 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 a program on the Neil's doing on hot flashes um, and menopause. Uh, we've got a weight loss program that Dr. Raman's starting up with. We have a free fight diabetes with food program that you, anyone can sign up for. So, and you can find all those on our, on the website at pcrm.org. Then the last thing, just as important as the other two that we overlook sometime, and that is you've got to recruit as many people as you can to help you push because change is hard. And so whether it be friends or family members or coworkers or online communities or classes or whatever, it's building a community around change. We, we know that the social network we live in, not, not social media, but the social network um, is, is extremely important uh, to help us navigate change. And so I, I think that most people, you know, haven't thought through all that and they give, you know, they, they, they try to engage and then they just give up because they, it, it is hard. And, and I, again, and again, what makes it hard is the simple fact that eating is learned behavior. And I don't think we talk enough about, about that part of it. Listen, we don't need any more research on the best way to reverse type two diabetes, right? We, 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 we know that what we need research on is the best way to help people change their behavior. And, and um, th because that's the hardest part, it's, it's not eating the quinoa, it's teaching yourself to not eat those other, the, the foods that are driving the high fat foods and such that are driving the type two diabetes. This is such a great way to look at it. There's so many gems from this interviews that I'm picking up. I just want to repeat them because they're so powerful about how we're all athletes, how when we're stressed, we actually need more exercise that really that really hit with me because I exercise anyway every day, but I never thought, hey, if I'm more stressed, I need more exercise because exercise is my medicine for stress. So that makes right. sense. And about this eating is a learned behavior because I think about how Dr. Clapper has said there's no failed vegans that were born vegan. And I think about people like Gar Goldhammer, the son of Dr. Alan Goldhammer, who's not only vegan, but maybe 
be the strictest kind of vegan there is, right? SOS free. And he, he doesn't struggle. I mean, this is all he knows, right? Right. So I, I, this is just, yeah, this is a fantastic interview. And let me read some nice comments. Ms. Iris says, Dr. Loomis looks great. He is also very smart. That is so true. And Sherry says, great overview, Dr. Loomis. Uh, and she's looking forward to, I guess she has a, a November appointment with you. And there's a question if the Barnard Medical Center takes health, any kind of health insurance and if uh, somebody living in Canada could actually have an appointment. So um, thank you for the kind comments, um, first of all. Uh, second of all, we take all, on, so, so PCRM and the Barnard Medical Center, we're actually a not-for-profit, believe it or not, for those of you who don't know. So we're a not-for-profit. And um, as part of our mission, we take all insurances. Uh, now, I say that there are some restrictions, you know, some Medicaid, we, we participate in all the, in DC Medicaid and, you know, Virginia Medicaid and some of the Medicaid HMOs. There may be some issues if you have Medicaid, say in California, that, but we have a billing manager that can help sort all that out. But in general, we take almost, we take all, all insurance plans for the most part, so, you know, 98%. So we take Medicare, we take United Healthcare, we take Aetna, we take UA, you know, um, a Blue Cross Blue Shield on and on and on. Unfortunately, um, we cannot see patients who reside in a uh, foreign country right now. The, the licensing laws around medicine are archaic and, and very frustrating, let's just say, uh, because from, from a telehealth standpoint, now you could, you could come to D.C. and see us live in person, I think. Uh, I don't know how you, what the insurance implications of that would be, but we couldn't, we can't do telehealth. The telehealth laws are, I have to have a license where I sit and where you sit, right? So um, if, if, I, if, you're in, if you're in Wyoming and, and I'm in DC and I don't have a Wyoming license, I can't see you. If you came to DC, I could see you because we're both sitting in the state where I'm licensed. So it's not where you live, it's where, where you're physic literally physically are sitting, right? Um, and the other Problem is, is that you know every you might say, well, why don't we just get licensed in all the states? It, it, it's an incredibly tedious and difficult process to get a medical license. Literally, if I apply for five different medical licenses, I've got to request five different medical school transcripts. I've got to get fingerprinted five different times. I've got to figure fill out a fifty-page, twenty-page application for every single one of those. So it's not just you can't. It's not like you can just go online, click a button, and say, I want licenses in these ten states. Hopefully, that's going to change. I, I think the, the explosion of telehealth and the recognition of how powerful a tool it is because of COVID is going to hopefully lead to some changes in medical licensure, but that's a slow process. And so right this minute, um, we cannot see patients who live um, outside the country, unfortunately. Oh, that's too bad. Hey, I have a question that came in from you. And um, I know you can't be somebody's doctor, but maybe you can kind of just yeah, generally answer general. the question. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, this is from Laurel. And she asked to Dr. Loomis, will I ever get off medication for hypertension? And how can I reverse hypothyroidism and get off levothyroxine through diet and lifestyle? I'm 63 and have been hypertensive since 25 on meds since 30. Oh God, this is so long. I drink a lot of water, hibiscus tea, eat beets every day, have eaten whole food plant-based for 10 years, exercise moderately. I've reversed high cholesterol, GERD, acid reflux, fatty liver, acne, obesity, current BMI is 28.1 and more. I have low sodium, potassium, magnesium, so I never supplement with the latter two. However, my BP is being controlled with chlorothylidone and lisonopril, and I have a recent diagnosis of hypothyroidism. Thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so high blood pressure for the most part is, is really a lifestyle related disease. There is a genetic predisposition, but you know, as, 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 as Dr. Campbell says, you know, kind of genetics loads the gun lifestyle pulls the trigger. Right. So um, in, in general though, um, most people will respond quite well to, to strict changes in their diet. And the more, the more in general, the more family, the more genetic kind of predisposition, the stricter you have to be. Um, and so some of the lifestyle influences on blood pressure are weight loss and, and, you know, BMI of 25 is less than 25 is optimal in general, every 10 pound weight, every 10 pounds, you loses about five points on your blood pressure. Um, eating a plant strong diet, a, a, a high fiber, low fat plant strong diet is the biggest bang for your buck. That's about 10 points. Um, limiting your sodium intake to about 1500 milligrams a day is about four or five points. 
One thing we overlook, however, commonly is, um, is potassium. So it turns out it's probably not the absolute value of sodium that drives blood pressure. It's the ratio of sodium to potassium or potassium to sodium. And in general, as long as your kidneys are normal, we need about three times more potassium than sodium. So we need about 4,500 milligrams of potassium to about um, uh, 1,500 milligrams of, of sodium. Most people, when they think about potassium, the first thing that comes to mind is what? Bananas, right? And bananas are a decent source of potassium. They have about 400, 450 milligrams per, per banana. Beet greens have 1,300 milligrams per cup. Sweet potatoes have 950 milligrams per cup. Um, lima beans have about 900 milligrams per cup. So there's lots of foods that have a lot more potassium. And in general, besides beet greens, most of the green leafy vegetables, so there is a website that I recommend patients visit oftentimes. It's not a vegan website, but, but what you'll see is like, even when you go to the calcium article, cow's milk's like number 20 on the list as far as sources of calcium. But if you, it's called the world's healthiest food. So if you just Google world's healthiest food potassium, it'll take you to a great article that explains all this and then has a chart of foods that, and their potassium content. So you don't need to get a calculator out, but you can eyeball that. Um, regular physical activity um, is about five points. And that's a, that's 75 to 150 minutes a week. Um, even weightlifting is um, light weightlifting two or three days a week is five points on your blood pressure and then limiting alcohol or eliminating alcohol. And, and for alcohol and male, it's no more than two drinks a day. Females more, no more than one drink a day. You have to be careful how you define a drink. It's 14 grams of alcohol, which is the amount of alcohol and one 12 ounces of five point of five percent beer, about five ounces of wine or about an ounce, ounce and a half of hard liquor. And there, you can run into problems there because if you like craft beer and you go have an imperial stout, you have a couple pints, you're like, oh, I'm good. I only had two drinks. So that's, you know, it could be 8% alcohol. And, you know, it's really five drinks, right? Um, now, there are a few other conditions which can drive blood pressure up that you have to be sure you don't have. Probably the most common one is that gets undiagnosed as sleep apnea. Um, and so if people snore at night, that needs to be checked out. There are also some drugs that can raise it. Um, um, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Motrin and Advil Aleve can raise your blood pressure. So you need to be very careful with those. And also decongestants like Sudafed can raise your blood pressure. Um, as far as the thyroid goes, uh, depending on the cause of it, there, there, I, I do see a few people that get diagnosed with hypothyroidism and it's not really hypothyroidism, it's iodine deficiency. Um, iodine deficiency is not necessarily related to being on a plant-based diet uh, per se, uh, iodine, we just not have to worry about iodine because there was plenty of iodine in the dirt and the soil and it got into our food. But after decades of farming the same soil, the soil has become depleted of iodine. And, and even in um, the government recognized this even you know, 100 years ago, 20, 1920s, 1930s, they started to subsidize the salt companies to iodinize salt, right? So table salt, Morton's table salt has iodine added. And you need 150 micrograms a day, which is about, about the amount of, of iodine in, in a three-fourths a teaspoon to a teaspoon of, of iodinized salt, which is, by the way, that's also 1,500 milligrams of, of sodium. A lot of people, when they develop that, when they adopt a healthier lifestyle, they either stop using salt altogether or they switch to like pink Himalayan salt or sea salt. It's still salt, still sodium, but it doesn't have iodine in it. And so, um, so oftentimes um, what I'll do in a situation like that is I'll put people on a, a, a small iodine supplement. I, I personally take kelp. It's just ground up because you can do it with seed vegetables. You can get dulce and kelp and nori and crumble it up and put it in your soups and stews, but it's a little tedious to do that. And I, I get lazy sometimes. So I just take a kelp supplement. If I go have some vegan sushi uh, that, had, you know, with the seaweed, I, I might, I'll skip the dose that day, but I take a kelp supplement that has 150 micrograms a day. I have seen patients that uh, their TSH uh, normalized after that. Uh, some people, though, have another condition called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And once the thyroid is damaged, unfortunately, it's damaged and you may need to be on thyroid medicine. But um, um, iodine is, is a nutrient of concern that we overlook sometimes, um, in fact, that, that people need to pay a little closer attention to. But it's not a personal failing if you're thyroid. I mean, you know, I don't. I mean, no, I no, 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 no. I it's not I a lifestyle. It's not a lifestyle related disease like it's not really a foodborne illness like type two diabetes. Yes. Right. But, but BMI of 28.1, that's not obese, but would that still be considered uh, overweight? No, and could, it could would somebody, be. yeah. So could possibly losing weight help a little bit? It would, yeah. Pleasure? So every, every, 
every 10 pounds you lose is about five points on your blood pressure. That's very interesting. I don't know if you can answer this question, Dr. Loomis, but somebody wants to know where you can find a vegan man in New Zealand. I don't even know where to find, I don't even know where to find one in the United States. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah, I can't help you with that one. Oh, that is, cool. <laughs> that is funny. Well, you just, I, I mean, I, I didn't really know you till this interview. You, you're just, in, I really, I mean, it's not that I didn't like you before, but you're just, I just love your, just your way of being. I can, I can only imagine how great you are with your patients. Cause you're, you know, you just, you seem like very, I don't know. I just, I, I like you. I really like oh, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, you, you know, the thing is this, um, it's very interesting. So, so if you look at burnout rates in doctors, right. It, it, primary care doctors, the burnout rate is, is incredible. Like, you know, hundred percent of doctors will get burned out practicing pri- almost you know, 80%, 90%. And it's, I think it's because we never do anything for our patients. We just play whack-a-mole with their health, right? Up pops your blood pressure, we'll whack it down with some pills. And up pops your cholesterol, so we whack that down with some pills. And up pops your sugar, we whack that with some pills. And then we start whacking off body parts, right? We have breast cancer, colon cancer. We, you know that we call that healthcare, but we never make anybody healthier, right? We're just adding, we're adding years to their lives, but we're taking away life from their years, right? And it's very frustrating. And I was in that mole. I've been, I've been in practice 25 years or so before I went plant-based and, and it was the same thing. You know, you just get, you just get tired. You just never doing anything for anybody. And once I discovered lifestyle medicine where we can really and truly add years to our patients lives, but sustain life in their years. Right. So if you think about that, you know, what does healthcare look like? You know, this is well, this is dead, right. You, you kind of start this slow decline. You hit 25, 30, you start this slow decline. You hope you make it to 80. You go to the doctor and try to keep this curve from going down too fast or too steep. But how do we do it? You know, here's your blood pressure. Here's some pills. And now here's some cholesterol. And here's this. And so we just kind of slowly but surely uh, keep adding. To, we either add pills or take off body parts to get you to 80, right? And it, recognizing it doesn't have to be that way, right? There's no reason the curve can't look like this, right? So we all have to die. I, I, I can't remember who said this, Dr. Greger or Kim Williams, Dr. Kim, Kim Williams. Williams. I, I just, I don't want it to be my fault. You know, yeah, exactly. Or take the eye out of die, right? That's the other thing. And, and so, um, and so how do you do that? How, how do you, how do you practice true healthcare where you add years to the lives to our lives, but sustain life in those years, right? Well, we already talked about it. It's, 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 it's replicating our ancestral lifestyle through finding emotional health, nutritional health and physical health. What's interesting about that contract, and so this is why I'm so happy all the time, because this is great, right? I love this stuff. So what's interesting is at age 51, I'm way down here, right? And at age 62, I'm back up here. When was the last time I was this healthy, right? So people ask me, how old I am? You know what I tell them? I'm 30 with 32 years experience, because that's how I feel, right? (laughs) You you have to write a book. You have such a great way of, of phrasing things like, add pills, remove body parts. I mean, just the way you say things, it's just, I hope you'll write a book someday. Well, yeah, I'd like to. It's just uh, just out in my spare time, which is pretty much non-existent because <laughs> yeah. between work and, and trying to stay active and train for racing and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's I, I still do that. I still run the COVID's put a little damper on my exercise, my, my com- competition, but I'm still working out pretty hard. And I, I, I you know, I run five, seven miles a day and bike 15, 20 miles on the days I don't run. And oh, yeah, somebody yeah. asked if you actually wear a bike helmet when you're running. I do wear a bike helmet. Uh, yeah, everyone should wear a bike helmet. That should be, um, yeah, there's, and if you don't wear a bike helmet, then be sure to sign your organ donor card. Oh my <laughs> so. God. You, have, you know, you got to take my stand up comedy class with me. You are really funny. You have just a great uh, <laughs> sense of humor. Now, I do spinning. Do I have to wear a helmet when I spin? No, you don't have to wear a helmet <laughs> when you spin. As, as long as you're going, as long as you're not spinning this way. <laughs> right. Oh my God. It's just, it's just such a pleasure. Such, so delightful to talk to you. And you know, if people haven't seen Dr. Loomis cook, you did a wonderful recipe. There's a, a link to that episode as well. Yeah, that was a lot of fun, I have to say. And, and um, you know, Karen, I was really worried about that because Karen is such a wonderful chef. And, and I, you know, she's, 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 tra- she's more formally trained than I am. I just, I taught myself how to cook uh, many years ago after I got divorced. I had three young kids and it was before I went plant-based. And I realized, you know, you can't take them to McDonald's all the time. So I, I taught myself to cook. 
And uh, so when I went plant-based, it was mu- that transition was much easier for me because I could take a recipe that I already liked or, and, and just veganize it, if you will. So, but, you know, I, I, I read cookbooks and such. So I was a little worried about that competition, but I, I think I, I, oh, you, I, you held your I, own. I we it. couldn't taste it, but the local, the people that were in there in person said yours was fantastic and it looked great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you did yeah. a great job. I mean, I mean, my God, you really are like a renaissance man. You have a sense of humor. You're good looking. You're a doctor. You're smart. You can cook. I mean, you're like the perfect catch. Yeah. Yeah. I'm <laughs> single too. So there. Oh my God. You just <laughs> opened up a whole can of worms right here. <laughs> end of the show. Well, I'm going to be working on that though. So uh, how, how geographic, <laughs> the first question is how geographically desirable does the person have to be? Because that's, yeah, I'm, I'm open-minded. And oh I, have, I, have, I, have I have a don't lot of freaking you know car miles too. I have a little side <laughs> business matchmaking, so we'll have to talk. Oh, about there you go. So all I, right, I, I, right. I, I, I actually, well, I'll, I'll tell you offline some of the matches yeah. I've made in the plant-based world. I'm kind of well yeah. known for this, so yeah, this yeah, is great. Yeah, that yeah. Well, it's just been it's just really wonderful talking to you, and uh, thank you for the work you do. And you have just really some of the best jobs in in the plant-based world. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Loomis. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. We have a bonus show today at 2 p.m. when Tommy Balsamic from California Balsamic Vinegar will be making recipes using basil vinegar, including a lemon basil Alfredo. Doesn't that sound good? You've tasted those vinegars. Didn't I send you two bottles for being on the show last time? I have not. I didn't. Well, you're getting them this time then for All sure. Right. So, yeah, so, right. so you can try basil or any other flavor that you like. Thanks so All much, right. Dr. Loomis.